Dear colleagues, if uh, I may, I was told by the organizers that we should start. My name is Alexander Semenov. I come from the Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg, and it's great uh, to be back at the Central European University. I am very honored to be a graduate of that uh, wonderful um, uh, university. And um, I wanted to say uh, something. I, I greatly enjoyed the first day of the conference. I looked through the program. It looks uh, um, very interesting and, and very uh, intriguing. And uh, it's also great to see um, the legacy of Yehuda Elkana being enveloped into the center uh, and giving um, uh, insights and impetuses in, in thinking critically uh, and reflecting on what universities are and what do we do uh, in universities. And I must say that it reminds me of these old days at the CEU uh, when uh, not only there was a rigorous instruction in the graduate school, but also a constant reflection on what do we do here? Um, and I remember one meeting with Ehud al Khan in his apartment when he invited graduate students and, and uh, invited us to talk uh, about uh, our experiences at that, uh, at that university. I would venture to say that the Central European University was uniquely positioned to be this spot of reflexive moment about the university because it's a newcomer. And as we know from uh, Moscow Tato Semiotic School and Yuri Lotman, um, it's, a, it's a situation of the frontier. When you are a newcomer, when you are just joining the club of academic excellence and academic reputations, then you uh, are in the situation of defamiliarization. You don't know what you're doing, and that invites uh, reflections. And I think it's very befitting the place here, Central European University, that we have this reflection in what uh, university, uh, universities do on how do we govern uh, universities and I would like to also say that probably it's also true of another frontier university which is Higher School of Economics. It's also a newcomer and we also um, try to reflect on uh, what are these uh, features and uh, monsters and creatures uh, that we call universities. And without any further ado, I would like to open uh, what uh, appears on the program as panel one, uh, myths and illusions about university governance, a long-termist, a long-term view or a long-termist uh, perspective. Uh, and this first speaker, uh, first speaker on this panel is uh, Professor Rivka Falhey. Um, uh, uh, she comes from uh, Kohn Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas, and I would like to mention that as far as uh, I remember, Yehud al Khanna was a co-founder uh, of this uh, wonderful institute. Uh, uh, Professor Falhe has been uh, a fellow at numerous prestigious uh, learning and uh, advanced uh, research uh, centers, uh, and I would like to mention just a few, Stanford Humanities Center, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Berlin, the International Research Center for Cultural Studies in Vienna, uh, among them. Uh, I also would like to quote uh, a project uh, uh, that she directed in 1994-1998 with a very interesting title to me as a scholar of, em of empires. It was entitled Europe in the Middle East, Political Key Concepts and Dialogue of Cultures, which I think relates to the questions of cross-cultural uh, encounters and dialogues that's been mentioned uh, earlier in the panel. Uh, and she's currently the director of the Bar Hillel Colloquium Series, which is done in cooperation of the Khan Institute, the Program for History, Philosophy, and Sociology of Science at the Hebrew University and the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. And the title of, and, and I, I should also mention that uh, uh, she serves uh, uh, as, as a member of the advising committee of the Humanities Center here at the Central uh, European University in uh, Budapest. And the title of her paper uh, is Knowledge in the Age of Governance, Promise or Problem. Professor Fathe, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much for your introduction. And I would also, of course, like to thank the CEU for you know, um, organizing and inviting us to this fourth event in the series um, that we have initiated four years ago in Berlin. And it has been going on for four years, each year in another place and country. This is you know, really, for me, a tribute to Yehuda. Okay, so 
now about my paper. Knowledge of the age of governance, promise or problem. Uh, I would just like to mention that I wrote this paper together with a colleague of mine, a scholar at my Minerva Umenti Center in Tel Aviv University, Neve Fumer, but he, he couldn't come here, but I would like to mention that he's a co-author of this paper. Now, what am, my uh, aim in this paper is to speak about the meaning of academic governance from an Israeli point of view. So the best, the main text that I'm going to an analyze is a report written by a government nominated committee who wrote about, uh, their mandate was to write about governance of universities. And the report was published in 2015. I'm going to analyze it and, and, and put it in context. Now the context means two things for me. One context is the Israeli one. So to see what happened between the law of a higher, the Council of our Higher Education that was legislated in 1958 and kind of provided the, the background to the ethos of universities at that time and compare it to what is happening now according to the report of this committee. And I should just say one word about this committee that it was nominated by the government and it consisted of mainly academics, some civil servants, and uh, some representatives of the public, and one a, a former super, Supreme Court judge. So it will be interesting for you to know who wrote these, this text, which will play a great role in my lecture. But I will anchor the discourse on governance, uh, governance also in other kinds of literature. First of all, for the first period, I would like to compare it or to say a few words of comparison with the report, the, the report of the Truman Commission from 47 at the United States. And, uh, and afterwards, I would like to anchor the, disc, the new discourse on governance in the literature, especially of STS, the Science and Technology Studies, who are dealing with this problematic as well. And last word is, why do I think that there is an added value to the Israeli case? So in Israel, most academic institutions are financed by the state, and this report really reflects something meaningful about the relationship between universities or higher education institutions, society, and government. And the second reason is that Israel is still in a stage of transition, but I, I, from what I hear here, I understand that you know, states of transition exist in many, many other places. Uh, so I thought this is a good point to start and present the Israeli case, but present it in context, not only in the, in the Israeli context. Okay. So my talk will consist of three parts. First, oh, first I shall shortly discuss the existing Israeli higher education law from 1958, as I said. I will be comparing its main ideas and language to an American document on the design of higher education, the American Truman Commission report from 1947. And although the two t contexts are very different, I shall argue that they represent a similar academic vision that is typical of what we can now term the welfare state age of academia. In the second part of the talk, I shall analyze the 2015 report, as I said, and third, uh, I shall try to suggest uh, what we need, that we need to read the underlying agenda of this report against the background of global processes. And, and I shall start my discussion, the first part, okay? The Israel Council of Higher Education Law, 1958. 
The law was passed in Israel in 1958. Its aim was to mediate between the state and the institutions for higher education and to anchor these relations in legislation. The law stipulates um, okay. so the law stipulates that a recognized institution is free to manage its own academic and administrative affairs as it sees fit within the framework of its budget, end of quote. This law was preceded by years of heated debates in the Knesset and repeated rejections of bills. The main bone of contention focused on the relative weight of two central and contradicting interests perceived by contemporaries. On the one hand, there was the reign of academic freedom, it's a quotation in the words of the Minister of Education at the time, Mencian Benio, and the desire, on the other hand, to recruit academia and its research programs for the needs of the young, recently established state. So I'm quoting from the new academic freedom, he said, wrote, uh, has taught our generation to stand opposite reality and to make the effort independently and courageously to observe it, to research it, and to fit its veils of, minister, of mystery, disregarding prevalent opinions and various prejudices." End of quote. So on the one hand, academic freedom and the role of academia in critically thinking of the affairs of the state. On the other hand, Knesset members made reference to the unity between science and labor in the colonizing, pioneering existence of the state during its first decades. And in order to ensure the needs of the state, the law proposed that the Council of Higher Education be headed by the Prime Minister and that the Council should also include the Ministers of Education and Culture and Legislators and Security Specialists. These ideas have never you know, been further pursued. Of course, the legitimization that f followed these debates resulted in a vague, sometimes ambiguous terms of the law. On the one hand, the clause stated above that a recognized institution is free to manage its own academic and administrative affairs seems to safeguard the autonomy of higher education institutions. On the other hand, the head of the Council of Higher Education is a political person, the Minister of Education, responsible for recommending the nominations of all members to the government and to the president of the state. Still, the law states that in order to ensure the high academic and managerial quality of council members, it's a quotation, as well as the authority of the council and its most important committee for planning and budgeting, the minister is obliged to nominate only members with high status and well-recognized position in the field of higher education and to consult with the heads of the academic institutions in the process of choosing his nominees. These are crucial nominations and they really a touch on the connection between state and university's interest. In spite of the tensions and ambiguities of the legal arrangements described above, the Israeli system of higher education managed to maintain some balance between political demands and academic needs for about 40 years. Such balance was anchored in a set of norms that guided higher education institutions in the Western world after the war and were also accepted in Israel. The practice, in practice, Education ministers chose an authoritative public figure, such as a former justice of the Supreme Court, to preside over the meetings of the council and left it alone to make its decisions. So basically, they did not intervene, intervene or intervene very little. 
a norm of academic freedom gradually emerged and seemed to stabilize a boundary between the political and the academic, and a mutual respect of the sides towards each other, at least within certain limits. And on the whole, the Israeli academic system has been very successful and prone with achievements. So now I'd like to offer a quick comparison between the Israeli discourse following the 58 law and the American discourse on higher education following what was known as the Truman Commission of 47. While the two academic systems are of entirely different scale and the two states have a very different political character, I nonetheless believe this comparison is illuminating as it points to a comparable idea not so much regarding the question of how to run an academic system as a question of what is the aim of academic knowledge and how this aim should affect the government-public academia relations. The point of departure of the American discourse was the rights of individuals for developing their personal abilities and the duty of the community to facilitate the achievements of each individual beyond racial, religious, and gender prejudices as well as beyond financial barriers. Thus, the committee wrote that, quote, it is the responsibility of the community to guarantee that financial bar barriers do not prevent any able and otherwise qualified young person from receiving the opportunity for higher education. In the liberal and progressive discourse of the commission, the emphasis on individual rights uh, connected to the national vision of a democratic society and obliged the state to offer equal opportunities to all members. Interference in education was a novelty in America. It had to be supported by a strong progressive ideology in order to justify the allocation of great public resources and appease the fears of academic institutions from losing their freedoms. The bridge was found in the idea that the goal of higher education is wider than just the creation of new knowledge and its transmission to future generations. Rather, developing individual abilities was connected to the training towards good citizenship and leadership, participation in communal life and social responsibility. And I'm quoting from just one quote from this report, federal interest in higher education tied to the aim of producing a, sm a strong democratic citizenry. The federal government, on its own part, had to ensure a steady financial investment coupled with commitment of non-interference in curriculum, in administration, staff, and library resources. A balance between national and societal needs, on the one hand, and the needs of a free, autonomous academia, on the other hand, was that it was thus articulated by the committee. Uh, government, both federal and state, can best safeguard the vast stake it has in the development and maintenance of the strongest possible system of higher education by exercising leadership rather than authority. This is what I want to, to uh, stress, of course. The Truman Report has not brought about a process of legislation. Still, in this respect, similarly to the Israeli case, it had great effect on the discourse on higher education and the principles it had underlined. Massive state investment in the system with no intervention in the management of institutions and underlying national ideology, individualistic and liberal and democratic in the United States and in Israel more statistic and incentives for active identification and participation in the national enterprise. These were the features characterizing both systems for about 40 years between the 40s and the 80s, let's say. The informal balances, however, achieved not in legal terms, but growing out of a basic understanding of the rules of the game, have eroded since then. My analysis of the Israeli situation will point out to the new rules of the game that are not specific to Israel, though, but are symptomatic for a much wider and worldwide approach with respect to the nature of academic knowledge, the public university's institution, as well as a question of its role in a democratic society. So I'm moving to analyzing this. Uh, the 
university. Oh, sorry. Yes. I call this part from autonomy to governance. The second problem of the Israeli governance report, and more broadly of the neoliberal academic climate, is the picture of the relations between academy, public, and government. The way things are presented in this report, the main problem the Israeli academic system suffers from is what they call a governance deficit. The report points out that academia should be publicly funded only if it follows an elaborate set of conditions, efficient use of budget, monetary supervision, transparency, and more. But of course, I would assume no one is questioning the fact that just like any other public body, the academic institutions should be responsive, uh, responsive to the procedural requirements of administrative and financial accountability and transparency. The problem, in my view, is that these managerial requirements are used here as an excuse to suggest that the academy requires not merely administrative reforms, but rather a reform of the very essence of the relations between academy, government, and civil society. So this is going back to the uh, uh, social contract as was, uh, had already been suggested here. In other words, the catchword governance is not merely about fixing administrative irregularity, it is improving regulation or a better definition of, of legal powers and roles. At bottom is the fact that the same requirement is addressed both to knowledge and to the university as an institution to always be at the service of something else, to subject itself to a very particular ethos of profit-oriented productivity and to subordinate to the government. This is apparent in the problematic change of the use of the word autonomy. On the one hand, the report states that the autonomy of universities is a fundamental principle and that the academic freedom of researchers, students, and institutions must be safeguarded. In the same breath, though, it expresses a view that these bodies require tight and constant regulation and a limiting of their authorities. The basic view is that autonomy should not be determined from within like the Kantian subject, but from above. Not the internal setting of boundaries, but an external one. The academy should not merely aspire to be attentive to public, national, economic, or cultural needs. And it should not merely work in synchrony with them. Rather, it should be conducted and controlled in accordance with what the government states as are its needs and maybe symptomatic was the minority opinion written by the Supreme uh, Judge, Ayala Pocaccia, who about one point really remarked, the point that the Minister of Education is still a political figure, and she remarked, this is not relationship or a mutual relationship of respect, this is more something like domination of one side and the other. Uh, on the one hand, the report states the autonomy of universities is a fundamental principle and that the academic freedom of researchers, students, and institutions must be safeguarded. In the same breath, though, it expresses a view that these bodies require tight and constant regulation and a limiting of their authorities. The basic view is that autonomy should not be determined from within but from above. The point uh, is this. Universities are perceived as institutions that if not constantly supervised, pose a constant risk of abusing their autonomy. Thus, the report constantly emphasizes the need to have academic freedom, but also to limit and restrict it. It keeps referring to limitations by laws, by the proposed governance council of higher education, and by financial requirements and vital national and social needs that the government would express. We should also note that there is simply no mention of the possibility that the government is itself in need of restraint against its own power, an idea that is a basic principle of any democratic worldview. The report simply presupposes that the government always knows how to distinguish between real needs and mere 
personal political needs. Here then is a deep point. This approach ascribes to the government and the state precisely the ideal of truth and knowledge that it refuses to grant to the university. While the university ethos does not present universities as authorized to declare what is true, but rather as sites that are dedicated to the constant search of knowledge through learning and critique, the government's ethos, on the other hand, views the government as precisely having this capacity. This points to a deeper problem. This picture of knowledge rules out in advance the very possibility that meaningful knowledge in any discipline might cause us to change the way we understand the very needs and goals of society, or even of the market. That knowledge, both in the humanities and the exact sciences, might require us to rethink how we understand what is valuable, what is profitable to us, what are our standards of rationality, what is freedom, equality, and democracy, and what kind of society we should aspire for. In other words, the word governance implies what I call a unidirectional picture of the relations between government and academia. The former always dictates needs and goals for the latter, but it ignores the possibility that the latter can also inform the former, or at least suggest to the former information or ideas to be considered. Much time. Okay, so I, I should not be able to come to, the, to what I wanted to do, the analysis of the uh, literature on neoliberalism and audit culture, and I will just go to the conclusions. I have argued here, following the literature and academics in the neoliberal age and the emergence of audit culture, that the academic world in Israel as well as globally is undergoing a deep transformation. This is a point I want to make. It's not just a matter of administration and management and uh, you know, responsibility with the money. We would be wrong, however, to mark this transformation under the word governance if, by that word, all we mean is something roughly along the lines of new management practices or a change in the economic and administrative model of the relations between government agencies and academic agencies, between public funds and private funds. My argument is that under the technical surface of a deep transformation, under the technical surface of, of this vocabulary, a deep transformation is hidden. One that has an effect on our fundamental perception of what we understand by knowledge. Secondly, this transformation affects what is understood as the role of universities in an advanced, namely scientific, technological, and informed democratic societies. Common to both these transformations is the loss of the university's autonomy, again in two senses, the autonomy of knowledge and the autonomy of the institution. Second, we must be vigilant against what we might term the ideology of governance. So I want to make a distinction between the practice and the ideology. By this I mean we should draw a clear difference between the valid versus invalid requirements implied by this term. It is legitimate to demand that universities should be responsible with a budget, that academics should not waste public funds but utilize them well and that the academy should not see itself as an ivory tower detached from the public, but one that has a symbiotic relationship that contributes back to the public, both in terms of education and in terms of the fruits of research. However, these valid requirements are today used as an ideology that alters not the how, but the what of academic uh, activity. As the studies show, the instrument measurement, evaluation, oversight, transparency, is being fetishized. The means, so I'm all for measurement, but not as a fetish. The means becomes an end in itself. All knowledge gradually changes into bite-sized information units, and all education transforms into technical training. Of course, 
The first to be negatively affected by such processes are fields like the humanities and to a lesser extent the social sciences, especially those fields that employ qualitative methods. However, I'm certain that we can predict that other fields up to and including the natural sciences will also be adversely affected by this commodification and atomization of knowledge. What then am I proposing? I believe we must insist, I go back to Yehuda, on the enlightened vision of academia as a place of free creation of new knowledge, free to choose what knowledge is worth being transmitted and free from the state and from the market. So we need to be aware that there is a growing body of literature that does important work of demonstrating the adverse effects of two trends, the marketization and commodification of knowledge and the way audit culture, so creating subjects who are flexible and self-governing and really s serve uh, the, the authorities and, their, and, and also market needs. And we must also be aware that these kinds of criticisms are not limited to the academia alone. As I mentioned, these processes happen in other fields as well, in health, in schools, in law, in media, and others. And we need to be able to make the connection and analyze the picture as a whole. I believe that the correct way to criticize these major transformations and their serious negative effects in a way that would be relevant to the current discourse is to insist on two key distinctions. First, we must insist on a distinction within the concept of governance, between governance in the sense of optimized administration versus what I call the ideology of government, governance, which essentially means, or at least leads, to what I call servile knowledge. The second is the distinction between the main and secondary goals of academic research. We have to insist that short-term utilitarian productive goals of knowledge are only secondary in the university. I'm speaking about the university because there are other types of higher education institutions. The university must remain as its primary mission a unique place in which knowledge can be pursued autonomously and for its own sake. And the third point, I would like to make is not a distinction, but a, more a matter of vision. At stake is never only the university, but also the question of democracy. Modern democratic societies demand broad interest in history, in geography, in sociology, in political science, to instill the foundations for informed electoral decisions. It needs the understanding of literature and the arts to foster humane sympathies and capacities of identification and understanding. Development of critical thinking is needed against atavistic, non-rational, anti-democratic inclinations of both ruthless markets and authoritarian, authoritarian regimes. As the Israeli case makes clear, the ideology of governance is often based on the presupposition that the university is a potential threat a potential problem, a potential waste. This approach, I argued, is fundamentally anti-democratic and even authoritarian. It does not seek to strengthen the public, but strengthening academia's relation to the public. Or, instead, it tends to strengthen both state and markets at the expense of citizens, citizenries. In spite of the danger of sounding overly idealistic, I, I'm aware of it, I believe that saving the university from the dangers of the culture of governance also means promoting citizens and saving democracies. Thank you. Thank you very much.